All right, welcome to Chapter 6, Chemical Reactions and Quantities. So uh, we're well into the course now. It seems even a little late for this, this uh, fundamental uh, discussion of how chemists represent reactions and quantities. But of course, we needed all that preliminary information to lay the groundwork for being able to do these uh, fairly difficult at first, although hopefully easy to grasp concepts. So in this first part of chapter 6, we'll talk about equations for chemical reactions. Hopefully things you've seen before in whatever previous chemistry or science class that involves chemistry that you've taken. Um, so hopefully a lot of this will be familiar, although uh, we will be very particular about having everything just right so that you're well prepared for Chem 142. Hopefully you'll join me again for that or for whatever uh, end purpose you needed this course for since I would wager most if not all of you are uh, planning to be anything but chemists. Let's just take a moment here and review a chemical change. We talked about chemical changes and physical changes and chemical properties and physical properties back a little while ago. Uh, and so as a reminder, a chemical change occurs when a substance is converted into one or more new substances. So we're at the most fundamental level of atoms and molecules. We're rearranging matter and getting something new and different in a chemical change. How do we know or what uh, evidence is there that a chemical change is likely to have occurred? Well, if we see a change in color, if we have the formation of a solid or the formation of bubbles, and you have to be careful on all of these because sometimes uh, physical changes result in things that you might mistake for these signs of a chemical change. Uh, particularly if you're boiling water, uh, sometimes you'll notice the formation of bubbles, uh, dissolved gases that, that start to form well before the water itself boils. Uh, so just be careful, uh, but again, these are our classic uh, signs of a chemical change. We see over there the tarnishing of a silver uh, fork. We have the uh, original silver metal interacting with uh, sulfur to make silver sulfide, that dark substance that uh, any of us who have silver know will form eventually that silver tarnish. And then you can use any number of silver tarnish products. Usually they involve some sort of acid, typically nitric acid, and uh, along with some other things, uh, and uh, that will restore your silver to its original luster. And uh, table 6.1 here, types of visible evidence of a chemical reaction. Again, that change in color uh, that we just talked about. Um, if you heat up iodine crystals, they look very dark, and then you get a purple gas. That's just a physical change going from the iodine solid to the iodine gas. Uh, but because it's uh, such a dramatic appearance in color change, sometimes people might mistake that for a color change because the really intense solid gets to a more dispersed gaseous, uh, much more obviously purple, whereas the solid looks like a very dark purple or even a black. So there are, again, times where you might mistake it, but in general, and we'll try to keep things very generic here in the course, if you notice a color change, formation of a gas, again, different than just driving off a gas uh, if there's dissolved gases, uh, anyone who's had a cup of cold water uh, by the nightstand uh, probably notices by morning, uh, if you haven't uh, drank it all in the night, uh, that there's uh, some bubbling. And that's the dissolved gases that uh, get less soluble as the cold water warms up. So we're talking about making a new gas, producing a new gas. Uh, if you've ever mixed vinegar and baking soda, you, you know what I mean by the vigorous production of a new gas. If you've never done that, please go to the kitchen and mix vinegar and baking soda. It's uh, a lot of fun and uh, something you've been robbed of if you've never done that. Uh, third, we have the formation of a solid, a precipitate, and then finally for heat or a flame produced or heat absorbed uh, as another evidence of a chemical reaction. All right, so before we get too far in, let's pause for a learning check, make sure this is all making sense. So in this learning check, if you would please identify the visible evidence of a chemical reaction in each of the following. Number one, methane gas in an outdoor heater burns with a blue flame. Number two, bleach removes stains from a t-shirt. Uh, number three, bubbles of CO2 are released when baking soda is mixed with vinegar. That challenge I just gave you if you haven't done that. So go ahead, pause the video here if you need a, a few moments to uh, come up with your visible evidence or if you need to run to the kitchen and mix uh, baking soda with vinegar. And then when you're ready, start back up and we'll see how you did. Okay, so hopefully you were able to identify 
these uh, evidences. So for number one, that methane gas in an outdoor heater while you've got the heat released, uh, as well as the presence of a flame that generally indicates a, a combustion reaction. Number two, we have the color change, right? The bleach removes stains. So the stains had color and now the bleach removes them. So going from a color to colorless is an evidence of a chemical change, just like a change in color from one to another or going from colorless to colored would be other types of evidence of a chemical change. Finally, with number three there, uh, the one that hopefully you've done or just done, uh, so it would be the formation of a gas, that vigorous bubbling that indicates a new and different gas being formed, in this case, carbon dioxide being released by the baking soda, sodium uh, hydrogen carbonate, and vinegar, HC2H3O2. So as I've already said, a chemical reaction involves the rearrangement of atoms. At the most fundamental level, we are actually changing the bonding partners of these atoms. Therefore, we produce one or more new substances, uh, and we can observe this by the appearance of new physical properties. So even if you didn't catch these uh, chemical change evidences, maybe they were subtle, uh, we can investigate the products and find that there are new and different physical properties present. If we look at our little image there, we see the reaction when an antacid tablet, sodium hydrogen carbonate, baking soda, uh, forms uh, bubbles of carbon dioxide because of the uh, acid that's also typically present in either in the antacid itself or by the time it gets to your upset stomach where there's excess acid present. Now that we've talked a fair deal about chemical reactions, let's talk about how we write these, writing chemical equations. Uh, and a chemical equation, of course, tells us what substances uh, react, the reactants as we call them, and what substances are formed, the products as we call them. So now you're going to start to write these things and talk about these things like a chemist would. So if we look at uh, this reaction, we have solid carbon, uh, probably charcoal would be one form, plus oxygen gas, O2, remember, is one of our seven diatomics, uh, H2, uh, O2, N2, uh, Cl2, Br2, and I2. Uh, oh, F2, sorry, forgot that one at the top of that column. Uh, those are our seven diatomics. So if I say fluorine, you understand that I'm talking about elemental fluorine as F2. And uh, certainly here we're talking about oxygen as O2. If we were talking about oxygen as O3, ozone, I would specify that. If I just say oxygen, you're expected to remember that it occurs naturally as O2 gas. Uh, then we have that little delta, uh, the triangle type symbol above the uh, the arrow there. Sometimes we show it below the arrow depending. Uh, it's more common actually below the arrow, but here we have it above. Uh, and then finally CO2 gas as a product. So uh, the um, symbols that you'll see a lot of times, of course the plus is to indicate the uh, multiple reactants or multiple products. Uh, that delta is indicated that uh, heat was used to get the reaction going. Uh, the um, S in parentheses is to indicate that that particular substance was a solid, either as a reactant or a product. Uh, L is uh, in parentheses to indicate a liquid. G in parentheses indicates a gas. So here we had solids and gases, no liquids involved. And then finally, AQ uh, would indicate that it's aqueous, it's dissolved in water. There can be other solvents, uh, but in our course, uh, we stick with uh, aqueous conditions. 142, we talk about uh, some non-aqueous conditions, uh, but here we're, we're looking at water-based chemistry. And here we see another example of an equation for a chemical reaction. This time we're looking at methane gas combining with oxygen gas to form uh, carbon dioxide gas and water vapor. Of course, water's a liquid at room temperature and pressure, but at the temperature inside that flame that's produced by the uh, methane and the oxygen combining, uh, we're at a higher temperature, high enough to uh, have our water uh, occur as a gas rather than a liquid. Uh, so you see that process, and then we have the particle diagram showing us the O2 molecules, those red diatomic molecules, the CH4, the uh, white uh, spheres representing the hydrogens, and the black representing the carbon. Uh, and then at the end, we uh, swap partners there, and we end up with those products. Uh, and as you see, actually, the uh, G, L, and S to indicate gas, liquid, or solid uh, is 
typically in italics, of course, in your handwriting, it's probably tough to distinguish italics from non-italics, but in uh, type printed things, we will usually see them uh, as italicized because that's our convention. Okay, and notice that we have subscripts and uh, all the chemical symbols correct and all those good things that uh, hopefully you're uh, taking into account when you start writing these chemical equations yourself. As important as the mechanics of writing the chemical equation are to make sure that you get the correct reactants and the correct products and you have your pluses when you have multiple reactants or products, you have your arrow to separate the reactants from the products, uh, it's also important that you keep in mind these things happen in a certain ratio. We have to have a balanced chemical equation to show the number of atoms in the reactant being equal to the number of atoms in the product for each element. Uh, if we didn't show the two is the coefficient here uh, on the left hand side or the right hand side for either the hydrogen gas or the water that's produced then we wouldn't have the atoms add up and that's a problem in nature we need to account for all the atoms we already talked about Dalton's atomic theory and that these atoms are indestructible and that they uh, are present before and after a chemical reaction they've just changed their bonding partners well if we don't account for every atom with our uh, balanced chemical equation, then it seems like we destroyed or created uh, atoms throughout the course of the reaction, and of course that's not true. So be very careful that you indicate the uh, correct balanced chemical equation by having the correct coefficients present. Once you write the correct chemical symbol for the element or substance uh, compound that you've made or start with, then you don't want to adjust subscripts. You, once you have the correct formula for each reactant product, you don't change that. The way that you get balanced is by um, manipulating coefficients, those uh, values out in front of the reactant or product. Uh, again, if it's a, a one, like we see here for the O2, gas is a reactant, we just uh, omit the one. We only put a coefficient value uh, when it's a non-one value. Okay, and we see on the left-hand side, we have a total of four hydrogen atoms from the two hydrogen molecules and two oxygen atoms from the one oxygen molecule. On the right-hand side, when we sum it up, we have, again, four oxygen atoms, this time uh, two each in two water molecules, and then two oxygen atoms, one each in the two oxygen molecules, so that all of our reactant atoms equal all of our product atoms we don't have any new or different atoms on one side or the other. We have the same number and type of atoms. We have them just uh, chemically combined in a different way. All right, so how do you do that? And that was already done for you, right? And hopefully it's easy enough to, to follow and to check. But how do you do this when uh, it's not necessarily done for you? Well, first of all, you need to place those whole number coefficients in front of the chemical formulas that uh, require them. So if everything already adds up, uh, maybe it is all in a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio. That happens very rarely, but it does happen. Uh, but most of the time what you'll see is that uh, in order to get the same number and type of atoms on the left-hand side, the reactant side, as the right-hand side, the product side, it's going to involve manipulating those coefficients, right? Subscripts are never changed. I've already said that. I'll say it again. Uh, we do not adjust the subscripts once we have the correct uh, reactant or product uh, molecules uh, represented. So uh, again, the subscripts are only used to tell us the compound or element that we have, never to uh, help us balance a chemical reaction. We're always balancing using coefficients. So in this case, uh, we had just aluminum and sulfur to start, and we made aluminum sulfide. So we knew that we had to have uh, two moles of aluminum because the aluminum sulfide has the subscript of two to follow the aluminum. So here we can just put a coefficient of two now in front of the aluminum. Uh, and sulfur, there's a subscript of three following that. So we know we need three atoms of sulfur to make that one formula unit of Al2S3. Uh, and so there we have how we can find the coefficients for a simple case. It does get more complicated than this, but hopefully the simple cases will help you get prepared for the more complicated cases. Of course, it's always a good idea to double check yourself. So once you think you have a balanced chemical equation, then go ahead and check to make sure that it is indeed balanced. So we see here uh, the methane plus uh, two moles or two uh, oxygen molecules, we'll say, right, we're going to deal with that mole thing that I let slip out a little 
uh, too early, uh, very shortly. And then we make one uh, carbon dioxide molecule and two uh, water molecules here. And we do our checking and we see that yes, indeed, we end up with a total of one carbon atom on the reactant side and one carbon atom on the product side, four hydrogen atoms on each side, and four oxygen atoms on each side. So we did our logical check at the end and we made sure that yes, that equation really is balanced. Uh, and uh, again, it relies on us putting the correct coefficients in where necessary, not changing the uh, subscripts of anything that has uh, a subscript present in its chemical formula. All right, so as our textbook has done in the past, we've got a guide to balancing a chemical equation here. So uh, this is a four-step process. And first of all, we're going to write an equation using the correct formulas of the reactants and products. Okay, so getting that correct chemical formula is key. And once we have it correct, we do not change those subscripts. Number two, we count the atoms of each element in the reactants and products. Number three, we use coefficients to balance each element if we're uh, unbalanced from reactant to product side. And then number four, finally, we check the final equation to confirm its balance, just like we did above by actually counting the number and types of atoms on the reactant side and making sure that it equals the number and types of atoms on the product side. Okay, so let's go ahead and put these steps into practice. So uh, we're asked to balance the following chemical reaction. Ethanol, C2H6O, burns in the presence of oxygen gas, O2, to produce steam, which is just the gaseous form of water, H2O, and carbon dioxide, CO2 gas. So uh, in step number one, we'll write an equation using the correct formulas of the reactants and products. In this case, each uh, formula was given to you after that compound or element was named. Uh, in uh, the future, uh, ethanol I would still give you. I don't expect you to have that one memorized. But oxygen gas, you understand that's O2. You know it's one of the diatomics. Steam, uh, hopefully you understand, is water vapor. So I wouldn't have to give you the formula H2O. Uh, and carbon dioxide, since we spent a significant time with the naming of compounds, uh, hopefully you would be able to take that name and come up with the formula CO2. So if I give you the official chemical name, uh, or if it's a uh, common substance like water, if I were to say ice, you would know it's H2O. If I were to say steam, you know it's H2O. Uh, those I would not typically give you in the future. But here, uh, as we're just starting out, I gave you each chemical formula uh, after naming that substance. So uh, we understand that ethanol and oxygen are the reactants because they produce steam and carbon dioxide. So on the left-hand side, we have our ethanol. And I would have to tell you that that's a liquid uh, at these conditions uh, in order for you to put that phase in. Uh, O2 gas, I did mention gas in the problem, so that's uh, okay. And then finally, uh, steam, you understand, is a gas. And carbon dioxide, we indicated was a gas in the final state. So we have the equation using the correct formulas for each of the reactants and products. We're good with step one. So far, so good. Now moving on to step two, we're going to count the atoms of each element in the reactants and products. So on the reactant side, we have two atoms of carbon in that ethanol molecule. We have six atoms of hydrogen in the ethanol molecule. And we have a total of three atoms of oxygen, right? One in the methanol molecule and then two in the oxygen molecule. If we look on the right-hand side, we still have just one, or rather, now we have just one atom of carbon in the one carbon dioxide molecule. We have two atoms of hydrogen in the water molecule, and we have three total oxygen atoms, one in the uh, water molecule, and then two in the carbon dioxide molecule. So uh, we don't balance uh, all of them. Fortunately, the, the oxygen atoms worked out. But again, if that's the only one that balanced, then we're going to have to do something here to uh, manipulate these uh, substances to get the right number of each reactant and product molecule. OK, so that takes us to step three, where we use coefficients to balance each element. And, and for a course like ours, where we tend to deal with fairly simple examples, believe it or not, uh, trial and error works the best. So we saw in the previous slide that we had uh, one atom of uh, carbon in the product, the one carbon dioxide molecule, and we had two atoms of carbon in our starting ethanol. 
Uh, so if we uh, take the coefficient of 2, uh, we, I picked the carbon intentionally because oxygen's in everything on the left and the right. So we want to uh, change the species that are only in one uh, substance first. Then we worry about the uh, species that are in every substance or multiple substances anyway. So we knew that we had to put that coefficient of 2 out in front of the carbon dioxide because that's how we were going to get our two carbon atoms on the product side to balance our two carbon atoms on the reactant side. Likewise, we started off with six atoms of hydrogen on the left-hand side, so uh, only two on the right-hand side. So we put a coefficient of three there in front of the water molecules to give us a total of six hydrogen atoms, three uh, molecules of water with two atoms of hydrogen each. And now we're ready to consider the oxygen. So on the left-hand side, we started with three atoms of oxygen from the previous slide. Uh, and now on the right-hand side, with those changes to the coefficients of the water and the carbon dioxide, we have a total of seven oxygen atoms, uh, three moles or three uh, molecules rather of water uh, with one oxygen atom each, and two molecules of carbon dioxide with two oxygen atoms each gave us a total of seven. So on the left-hand side, we have the one that's in the ethanol. Uh, and we can go ahead and put a coefficient of 3 out in front of the oxygen to give us a total of 7 atoms on the uh, left-hand side as well. And so now we can do our step 4 and do our double check. And indeed, we do get a balanced number of atoms uh, of each type on the reactant and product side. So we've done our job. Very good. Uh, of course, we're going to follow that up with a learning check to make sure you can do it without me leading you through. Okay, so here's our learning check. We have two reactions here. First, uh, determine if each equation is balanced or not. So uh, if it's not balanced, obviously, you can go ahead and uh, balance it. But uh, we'll take a look at each of these after you've had a chance to consider them yourself. Uh, please pause the video to do that. Then when you're ready, start back up and we'll see how you did in terms of finding out if each equation is balanced or not. And uh, if it's not balanced, going ahead and balancing it. Okay, that first reaction, Na solid plus N2 gas yields Na3N solid. Uh, hopefully it jumped out at you that this one is not balanced, right? We have one atom of sodium on the left and three sodiums on the right. We have two nitrogens on the left and one on the right. So obviously things are not, not uh, balanced as it stands. Of course, to balance it, what are we going to do? Well, uh, first of all, uh, let's take a look at the, the nitrogen because the nitrogen is a diatomic. So it means we're going to have to uh, have those in a whole number ratio. So uh, to get the two atoms of nitrogen on the product side, we would put a coefficient of two out in front of the Na3N. Uh, and now that gives us a total of six uh, atoms of uh, uh, sodium. So we'd have to put a six coefficient of six in front of sodium. We'd keep nitrogen just as N2 because we wouldn't show the coefficient of 1. So if you want to uh, complete this, there would be 6Na solid plus N2 gas yields 2Na3N solid. If we inspect that second uh, equation, we see that we have um, C2H4 uh, plus H2O on the left yielding C2H5OH on the right. And we're dealing with gas, liquid, and liquid for the phases of those in order. So if we look at the left hand side we have two atoms of uh, carbon in that uh, ethylene, uh, ethene rather is the official name of that substance but uh, that's not necessary for you to know here we just know that we have two atoms of carbon there uh, we have four atoms of hydrogen there plus two more atoms of hydrogen from the water to give us a total of six on the left hand side and then one uh, oxygen atom in the water to give us one atom of O on the reactant side. In the products, you have to be very careful. There's a good reason why we separate this. This happens to be ethanol, which you saw before as just C2H6O. Now we've separated it into C2H5OH, uh, and Chem 142 will talk much more about that OH group and why that makes this an alcohol and what's special about it. Uh, but that's the reason we separate the H's. Instead of just saying C2H6O, we have them 
uh, as C2H5OH. So be careful. Even within a given compound, you might have atoms that are separated and you do need to sum them together. So the two carbons are pretty easy to see. The six hydrogen atoms you might miss if you just see that H5 and didn't consider the H after the O. So there's a total of six uh, for the hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. So we are already balanced. This is one of those special cases uh, that we don't see a whole lot, but it does happen from time to time where all of the coefficients are one and therefore we do not show them explicitly. Okay, let's follow up with another learning check. This time uh, we're going to have you come up with the symbols and do all the mechanics of writing a balanced chemical equation. So based on uh, your word problem here, write a balanced equation for the reaction of nitrogen gas. N2, I don't have to give you that, but uh, here since we're just practicing, I uh, figured it was appropriate. With hydrogen gas, again, I wouldn't have to give you the H2 because you know hydrogen and nitrogen are both diatomics. To form ammonia gas, this one I would give you. I don't expect you've memorized uh, NH3 as ammonia yet. So uh, please pause the video at this time. Go ahead and Write your complete and correct balanced chemical equation for this process, and then when you're ready, start back up, and we'll see how you did. So using those steps, the first step is to write an equation using the correct formulas of the reactants and products. So N2 gas plus H2 gas yields NH3 gas, so using the correct symbolism for that. Uh, now we're on to step two, count the atoms of each element in the reactants and products. So in the uh, reactant side, we have a total of two nitrogen atoms from the N2 molecule and two hydrogen atoms from the H2 molecule. On the product side, uh, we have just one atom of nitrogen and three atoms of hydrogen in the ammonia. So we are not balanced to start. Uh, neither the hydrogen nor the nitrogen is balanced. Moving on to step three, now we're going to use coefficients to balance them. And, and first, I would suggest that we use the coefficient of two for the NH3, the ammonia molecule, because we know we need a total of two nitrogen atoms on both sides. Uh, and the only way we're ever going to get to anything meaningful with uh, N2 is if we have uh, the two in front of the NH3 to start. And then maybe we'll have to go up uh, and multiply both by some other value, but at least start there. Uh, once we've done that, that not only solves the problem of the nitrogen being present in an odd amount, but it also solves the problem of the hydrogen being present in an odd amount in our product. We uh, have to have uh, even whole numbers uh, for the uh, diatomics when they end up in uh, other species. So by putting that two in front of the NH3, now we've uh, balanced out the number of nitrogen atoms on each side. We've also made a total of six hydrogen atoms on the product side, which means we need a coefficient of three before the H2 gas on the reactant side. Step four, let's double check that all of these are balanced now, and we have a total of two nitrogen atoms on the left, and now two nitrogen atoms on the right. We have a total of six hydrogen atoms on the left and six hydrogen atoms on the right now that we've adjusted those coefficients. So uh, let's try one more just to make sure you're really getting all the steps involved in doing this correctly. Okay, so here we have in this learning check the challenge is to check the balance of atoms in the following equation. Fe3O4 solid plus 4H2 gas yields 3Fe solid plus 4H2O liquid. Generally when you have uh, numbers, non-zero coefficients shown, uh, you're probably dealing with a balanced chemical equation unless you have something like an uh, underline before one of the species where it's clear that your job is to find that coefficient. Uh, here we're probably dealing with a balanced equation. Oftentimes uh, when you just see no coefficients for anybody or if I use the term unbalanced and I usually try to highlight that, um, then you'll know you're dealing with an unbalanced reaction. So go ahead, pause the video here and figure out the number uh, of uh, atoms in the reactants or products as asked. Okay, so let's see how you did here. So the number of H atoms in products, well, uh, we have four water molecules with two hydrogen atoms each, so that's a total of eight. Notice also, if we were to look at the reactants, we have eight hydrogen atoms as well from the four H2 molecules. Uh, number two, the number of O atoms in the reactants, well, we have a total of four O atoms in the formula unit Fe3O4. 
So our choice B was correct there. Obviously, if you look at the product side, also four oxygen atoms uh, in uh, each of four uh, water molecules to give a total of four on each side. Number three, number of Fe atoms in the reactants. Well, it's Fe3O4, so that three subscript tells us that we have a total of three Fe atoms. If we look at the product side as well, the coefficient now tells us that we have three Fe atoms in our product. So if this was a balanced chemical equation, uh, and hopefully you were able to get the correct values for each of those atoms. All right, so now that we've had some learning checks, uh, let's uh, see if we can make things a little more complicated. Again, just to be prepared for these issues that will arise uh, come exam time. So uh, equations with polyatomic ions can get a little tricky. So when you're balancing these, uh, just remember that it's a unit. The polyatomic ion doesn't break down from left to right. Uh, the polyatomic ion just swaps partners in a chemical equation. So if we look at this example here, we have two moles of sodium phosphate, Na3PO4, uh, and it, it's aqueous, so we're dissolved in water here. And we mix that with three moles of uh, magnesium chloride, MgCl2, which is also aqueous. Uh, so on the left-hand side, everything's in aqueous solution, so they're uh, dissolved in water. Uh, as that reacts, so our arrow shows us that that this uh, set of reactants yields one mole of magnesium uh, phosphate, Mg3 parentheses PO4 and parentheses 2, two of those phosphate units here. Uh, and of course, we don't normally show the one as a coefficient, but this is just to highlight things. Uh, plus, uh, now we don't show the one for the one mole of NaCl that stays aqueous. Notice that that magnesium phosphate has an S, so that's the formation of a solid, a precipitate. As we look in our um, picture there on the slide, we see that sort of gel-like white solid uh, forming, and that's one of our signs of a chemical reaction. A visible change that indicates a reaction has happened is the formation of a solid. This is a special type of reaction called a precipitation reaction, uh, and we see everything went from being very far apart in the sodium phosphate solution and the magnesium chloride solution to being very close together, at least for the magnesium phosphate, into a solid phase, and the uh, other product than sodium chloride stays far apart in aqueous solution. So we look and we see, uh, and uh, again, they're not balanced initially, but when we uh, take some time to address this, we'll see that we can easily balance an equation like this if we're careful to keep the polyatomics together. So, so far we've got our polyatomic uh, phosphate balanced and our magnesium balanced, but we don't have our sodium or chloride ions balanced. Okay, so then our first step is to write the equation uh, of the reactants and products, and so this is just the similar to what we had on the slide. We just changed the order, and the order is not important. Whether you put the sodium phosphate first or the magnesium chloride first for the reactants, it doesn't matter as long as you have them correct and uh, have them uh, separated by that plus sign. Um, and the arrow to show yields, and then again, the reactant order doesn't matter. This time we have the NaCl first and the Mg3PO42 second. Uh, but that, that's fine either way. Just make sure you have the correct phase indicated to show that the sodium chloride stays in aqueous solution, but the magnesium phosphate separates out as a solid. Okay, here in step two, we're counting the atoms of each element in the reactants and the products. So on the left-hand side, we have three atoms of sodium, actually ions of sodium, uh, one uh, unit of the phosphate ion, one atom or actually ion of magnesium and two atoms are actually ions of chloride. On the product side, as we said, the sodium, we just have now one. The uh, phosphate, uh, we now have two units. The magnesium, we now have three units. Uh, and the uh, chloride, we have just one unit. So none of these are balanced in this equation. In the original equation, we did end up with some balance. Uh, but here, starting from our uh, steps, we have nobody balanced so far. Okay, moving on to step three, we'll use coefficients to balance each uh, element or each ion, each polyatomic ion, remember, is kept as a unit. So uh, we would need uh, to have a coefficient of two in front of the sodium phosphate to get us the two phosphate units on the product side. We would need uh, two phosphate 
uh, on the left hand sides of the reactants so we need that coefficient of two there um, in order to get the magnesium correct we would need a coefficient of three in front of the magnesium chloride to get the uh, three moles of magnesium ion that's indicated by the mg sub three in the product uh, and now that we've made those adjustments to the reactant side uh, we see that we're going to have to adjust the NaCl to give rise to the correct number of sodium and chloride ions and we can accomplish that by putting a 6 as a coefficient in front of the NaCl to get the uh, correct number and type of ions we need. Step 4, we'll check that final equation to confirm that it's balanced and we see, yes, 6 um, atoms are really ions of sodium on the left hand side and then 6 again on the right hand side. So that's balanced. Phosphate ions, we have 2 on the left now with that coefficient of 2 in front of the sodium phosphate to balance out the 2 on the right hand side in the magnesium phosphate. Uh, moles of uh, magnesium ions, uh, 3 on the left hand side now with that coefficient of 3 in front of the MgCl2 and then 3 on the right hand side in that magnesium phosphate product and finally chloride ions we have 3 uh, moles of the magnesium chloride with 2 uh, ions of chloride each so that's a total of 6 and on the right hand side again 6 now uh, being the coefficient in front of NaCl means we have 6 uh, ions of chloride in the product as well. Everybody is balanced. Very good. Well done. Let's end this subtopic with a final learning check. Okay, so here it is. That's what I meant by having that underline out in front is that it's your job to figure out what each of those is. So these are not balanced equations. Uh, there's uh, no um, non-one uh, coefficient values put in. You're going to figure out what each of those values is. This is good practice for uh, the homework sat in the exam where we're uh, typically dealing with multiple choice values and now you can get your um, mind around that idea of being able to pick out the correct sequence. Again, we're always moving from left to right. So when we have our multiple choice answer options, the first number shown is for the first reactant. Uh, if there's additional reactants, then that would be the next number. And then finally, the first product and then any additional products. So go ahead, pause the video, please. This will take you a little while. Um, and uh, that's good. It gives you some good practice and gets you ready for those things. So when you're ready, let's go ahead and start back up. And you can check and see how you did with these learning check questions. Okay, there we are. You have uh, for number one, B gave us the correct sequence, 2, 3, 4, 3. So 2 is the coefficient in front of the Fe2O3 solid, plus 3 is the coefficient in front of the carbon solid, yields 4 is the correct coefficient in front of the iron solid, plus 3 is the correct coefficient in front of the carbon dioxide gas. So again, hopefully if you can do the process uh, using those steps we talked about, you would just be investigating each of the uh, answer choices. If you can't come up with it on your own, at least with the answer choices present, you could go ahead and, and try them uh, and see. Of course, that'll take quite a while and you have a limited time on the test, but uh, if all else fails, that's something to, to try. Number two, we had uh, a2331 to give the correct balanced uh, equation, 2 moles of aluminum solid uh, plus 3 moles of uh, iron oxide, iron 2 oxide technically, uh, yield 3 moles of iron solid plus 1 mole of aluminum oxide. Okay, and that's the only uh, option that gave us the correct values for each coefficient of the reactants and products to give a balanced overall equation. Finally, number 3, 2 uh, moles of aluminum solid plus 3 moles of H2SO4, sulfuric acid aqueous, yields 1 mole of aluminum sulfate plus 3 moles of hydrogen molecules. So choice B was correct there. Uh, hopefully this is getting easier. Again, additional practice will help if you're struggling. If, if that's not the case, if you try to practice some more and it's still not coming together, please reach out to me. Uh, let me know that you're struggling and I'll try my best to help you probably by giving you some additional problems or um, making some suggestions on what you might try to uh, have this uh, process uh, come together for you. So hopefully it's going well. We're just into the first part here of chapter six. Uh, but again, this is probably the most difficult part. So uh, please do uh, try additional problems and make sure to get this uh, all squared away before you move on to the next part, chapter six.